So you may have to just press a button just to kind of um, confirm that you're happy with that. So uh, welcome to today's uh, House of PMO session, and it's about how to create a PMO service. So uh, a number of you may not even know what that term is, which is absolutely fine. Uh, we'll cover that off. Just a quick introduction first um, to me. So my name's Eileen Road, and I work with Lindsay. Uh, we set up both the House of PMO and also our training company, um, PMO Learning. So Lindsay and I have known each other now for um, over 20 years, um, though we've not kind of worked so closely together as we have for the last kind of half a dozen years or so. Um, in terms of my background, I was a PMO uh, person. I worked in and around PMOs. Um, I was a PMO manager in a number of organisations for 17 years. Um, and then after that, for the last 16 years, I've been on the other side of the table. I can never decide whether that's poacher turned gamekeeper or gamekeeper turned poacher. Um, but I now work with lots of organisations in terms of helping them establish uh, their PMOs and supporting the PMO people through coaching uh, and a number of other services. Some of you may know me um, as the uh, lead author of P3 or Best Monitoring Practice, uh, but also the Pay More Competence Framework, as well as a couple of other um, books that I've been involved in the, the production of. So I'm going to be taking you through um, the session today. We're just going to have a quick uh, bit of uh, chat with the audience and see who we've got on. We're going to look uh, just a, I'm going to do a very brief overview of services and service based PMOs just to set the context. And we'll talk about how, you know, we're going to set these PMO services up, how we actually kind of decide on what services that need to be delivered and then actually kind of developing the service. Now, we're not going to talk about running the service and, and the bits and closing down the service. There's already so much to cover in terms of setting up the service. And I was really concerned as I started putting the session together, thinking I've only got an hour. I haven't got a whole afternoon session um, to go through on this. So we're just really going to be focusing about kind of designing and, and establishing the service um, uh, for your organisation. And then we're going to uh, just tell you a little bit about a community the next kind of community-led project so for those of you who've been around kind of flash mob before we turned into the house of pmo may uh, recognize or may remember that we had a community-led project that led to the pmo um, competency framework we're going to set off a second um community project that's going to continue to build on the pmo service handbook but more on that later so first of all, let's just kind of have a look who's here in the in the group. So we've got quite a few um, on um, today. We've had uh, very few people have gone in the chat to say hello in chat. So can I just ask you if you kind of open your chat window and um, just kind of do a quick line in terms of kind of who you are, where you're at. And um, if you want to say what kind of company you're from, it's always nice to kind of know how broad or reaches as to whether we've got people who are inside the UK. So whereabouts in the UK might be, but more and more we're getting an international audience. So if you're not sitting in the UK, uh, a particular good welcome to you um, and just kind of drop in where you're from. So you're all, oh, there we go. They're starting to come in um, with uh, kind of the chat. So if you don't know where the chat window is, you should be able to kind of see that on your uh, Zoom toolbar at the top. Um, and you can be able to just kind of um, chat away as you go through. There we go. Wolverhampton, not far from where I live in Solihull, though I'm up in our Manchester office um, today. So there's a few people around there in there. Sam's from the West Midlands as well. And sunny Rochdale. So, uh, Tim, you're just a few miles up the road from us here in Hayworth. Um, so you could have even popped in the office and had a live session with us at uh, Glasgow. Um, uh, nice to have some people on from Scotland. We're going to talk about a little bit about the um, PMO conference, the fact that we're going to Edinburgh this year. So nice to have some Scottish people on um, as well. Excellent. So I will put the kettle, as soon as I finish, Tim, I'll put the kettle on. So nice to um, have a, a, you people to start saying kind of way around. Thank you for um, doing that. Now, um, we're not one of those people that gets very precious about who people um, speak to either. And um, what we um, we're, we're happy to do as well if you uh, want to. So if you want to do private messages um, of the correct kind, if you want to network with people who are um, 
who are here, feel free to do so, send some private messages. So if you see your friend on, feel free to kind of send some private messages to them as we go through. Uh, the more we can um, have as the um, uh, a kind of open conversation, the more then I can kind of respond to that as we go through the presentation. But also I'm very happy, you know, this is not just me kind of talking for an hour. I'm more than happy that we can kind of have people who've got um, things to say. I'll open up and you can kind of um, come in and talk around something from your particular organisation or actually ask the question. So I do have one uh, thing that I'm going to do before I, I kind of do kick off the presentation is I'm just uh, launching a poll. So you should have a poll um, arrived on your screen, which gives you four options um, to answer. Uh, just to help me kind of just gauge the type of kind of what's in the group today. So when I talk about is your PMO a service-based PMO? Well, yes, you obviously know what the service-based PMO is, you can type that. It nearly means we're kind of, we're working through it, you know, it's something we've definitely decided to do, not finished yet, but it's a work in progress. So we're thinking about it, and as I would expect, certainly the majority of people who are on here are thinking about a service-based PMO, uh, and an ideal, um, an ideal uh, webinar for you to attend and we do have a couple of people who are I still asking the question well what is a service-based PMO and that's absolutely fine because we'll be covering that as we go through the as we go through the session um, today so I'm just going to give you a, a few more minutes just to give everybody the opportunity to um, to answer that poll question so I think we're about there as, as much as we, we can. So let me just um, share the results with you on the screen. So you should be able to see the results there. So a good 60% are actually thinking about moving to a service-based um, PMO. And certainly um, the best practice would say that uh, a service-based PMO tends to be um, have a longer uh, shelf life than a, what we would call a support-based PMO and certainly kind of adds, uh, can demonstrate its value much easier than a support-based PMO. And again, we'll kind of come on in terms of what that means. So we've got um, a number of people who've already working in a service-based PMO. So I'm looking to those individuals to certainly come and share your experiences. So as we go through the, um, through the session today, do say, oh, I've got something to say about that. We did that, or we didn't do that, or we, this is what we've learned as we've gone through the process. And a few people who are actually going through the process again any lessons that you want to share any hints and tips uh, that you want to um, uh, contribute uh, please feel free to do so if you're not brave enough to talk stick them in the chat and, and we can kind of pick them up from there and as I said we've got a couple of people who are uh, here really to learn what a service-based PMO is so great that's um that's always kind of helpful for me to start to get that picture of the types of people who we've got attending the session so let's just um, have a look then at uh, what it services and what service-based PMOs actually mean. So we define a service um, as uh, one or more activities that are uh, undertaken to produce an output for a customer that delivers a desired outcome for the organization. So interestingly, uh, two things that I would point out from this whole definition of a service is that one is there is a specific output. Yes, it's, you know, it's not just kind of something we do. We're, we're always doing something to produce a specific out, output or um, for a customer. So it's not something we do for ourselves. We always have a customer. We're always doing it for somebody. And ideally, um, whatever that output is, we are actually in the process of, of delivering value to the organization. So it's part of contributing to um, delivering that kind of um, the, what the organization is trying to achieve typically against their uh, strategy. Um, Interestingly, Catherine, a really good point you've pulled up there, um, and this is becoming more and more common, I think, in, in, in some of our discussions. And when we talk about kind of delivering services, what we don't just mean is delivering those services internally, because potentially, particularly if you work for a professional services organisation, you will be delivering 
services to customers who are external to your organization. And again, we will touch a little bit on that because once we start dealing with customers externally to the organization, then actually there, some of the things that we put in place may have contractual um, connotations to the agreements that are put in place. So when we talk about a, a service-based um, PMO, what we're doing is we, we, we try to think of a, if we think about it as a, as a kind of a, a formal kind of restaurant and the things that happens in a formal restaurant is there's actually some kind of menu um, where instead of the customer just kind of turning up and saying, oh, I fancy gambling egg and chips today or I fancy duck lorange, we've actually got a list of things that we are prepared to have to, to cook for those individual customers. So we kind of, we limit what we do to the skills and capabilities that we have available to us. We, we limit it also to the set number of ingredients that we have available to us um, to use. And we also, it tends to be limited by the skills and the capability and the capacity of the individuals who are uh, working in that restaurant. And, and the interesting thing, isn't it, in, for those of you who are in the UK over the last uh, couple of weeks, it now has to have a calorie count against every meal. But uh, not that we would do that in the PMO, but the idea is, is that if we're a service based PMO, we have a list of things that we do. So our customers come and say, you know, these are the this is how we want to engage with you. And from a PMO perspective, we also may want to put some um, constraints around who's allowed to engage with us. There's some constraints on who. Um, which services are provided to whom. Uh, we may want to incur some um, cost and to do some cross-charging for some of those services. And there may be some other kind of conditions. Uh, it may be some kind of time bound. There may be some um, service level agreements um, to, the, to the services. Now, this whole kind of concept of services um, was really, um, I don't know whether it was first introduced, but it was certainly part of the P3 or best management practice. And certainly as I've continued uh, from uh, being the lead author back in 2013, and um, since then the appendix F, the infamous appendix F of the P3 or best management practice contains um, 24 different services, sorry, 28, I can't count, 20, uh, two different uh, service areas where it gives an indication of the types of services and the list of services we might be able to uh, provide um, whether we are uh, supporting delivery um, so supporting projects and programs whether we're doing center of excellence type activities or whether we're actually working at a portfolio level with the kind of senior management and overseeing all of those change it gives us these kind of um, 20 or different areas that we can play in now, what uh, one particular individual did, who was actually here um, on the on the on uh, in the um, session today, and I'm sure he'll uh, pipe up at some point as we kind of go through that, um, is um, take that, but also his experience, um, and over in, literally over a number of years, actually bottomed that out to actually do a lot more detail to provide what we would call a PMO service catalogue, which details all of the information around all of the services or the services that a PMO can provide. So uh, Stuart is actually um, on, the, on, the, on the session, um, and I'm sure he'll kind of, as I said, drop in when he has something to more to contribute. But this kind of um, PMO service catalogue is, it will never be complete. There will always be a huge number of services that we can provide. And this gives us about kind of seven, uh, 800 pages worth of potential services um, in there. Now, we um, in the House of PMO, when we've been establishing our um, House of PMO essential certification for administrators, analysts, managers, and directors, we use this as one of our core, um, core texts um, for, for the course. Uh, and what we've done on the House of PMO website is we've created um, an addendum, which has uh, some additional information on setting up a PMO, uh, sorry, setting up a service, running a service and closing down a service. So some of the things that I'm going to talk about today at a very high level will be an, on our House of PMO website. So um, I believe it's in the members area, but there is free membership. So if you're not a member, then do go and um, have a look um, 
for the, the addendum. It's got some more information in what we're talking about today. So in terms of the um, that huge book, and, and as you said, that's not even a kind of a complete list. Our first bit that we need to think about before we start about setting up a service is to start thinking about, well, actually, what services do we want to deliver for our organisation? Or more importantly, what services do we need or should we uh, deliver for our organization because what we don't ever want people to do is to look at that textbook and say crumbs it's going to take me a long time to implement them because no organization and um, will be implementing all of those um because they're just maybe not relevant you may not be able to get the funding you may not necessarily have the skills and capability to be able to implement all of those so we need a way to identify which services are most important to us now there is a, a document that we would suggest that an organization has um which sets out the strategy for what kind of services, how those services at a very high level are going to be delivered across the organisation. Now, this is always a, an interesting point because in a perfect world, and I often talk about in a textbook world. So in a textbook world, what you would have is a payable director who um, works uh, across the organization and looks at the portfolio of change that's about to be delivered over the next kind of 6, 12, 18 months and says, well, actually, if I look at that and I look at what we're doing with business as usual, this is potentially the kind of the key services we want to provide and how we can um, and how we can um, support all of that change. Now, we it, that decision may be, well, actually, we're only going to create uh, support and services for the top 10 strategic or the top 10% strategic projects and programs. It may be we're actually going to create services from a uh, for just the capital projects. Yes, it may be actually, we recognize there's gonna be four or five portfolios and we're gonna split uh, delivery of those services across all of those um, different uh, portfolios. So really some kind of a, a high level view of the services that are going to be um, provided and potentially where. And so in terms of kind of pulling that together, there's a couple of things that we need to do. Good old stakeholder engagement. Yes. Being able to kind of go and look at who the key kind of uh, service stakeholders might be. Now, that can range anywhere from senior management, senior exec at the kind of portfolio level. It will be um, project and program managers and the delivery team. And um, it will might be business as usual um, managers who want to understand you know kind of when changes are coming through and how that's going to be delivered as well as obviously um, the current PMO structure um, in the organization and deciding on what services we have to recognize you know and, I, and I'd love to find a PMO that does have an infinite budget an infinite number of staff but undoubtedly at some point we're going to have to kind of prioritize those services so the pay more service strategy it may not at this uh, point actually kind of list individual services it may just give a view of groups of services but what will underpin this will be an integrated PMO model so in order to be able to deliver the services to the portfolio, part of the PMO director's role is to make sure that we have the right structure of PMOs across our organization. So in the example that I've given you here, we've got an enterprise PMO, which is typically a portfolio office. We'll look at across the whole portfolio and do some reporting, and there will be a vision associated with what that PMO has been set up to do. The um, organization with this model has a large transformation program and so a, a standalone program office has been set up to support that particular transformation and again that particular um, PMO will have a 
will have a, a, a vision in terms of what that's there to achieve on behalf of the programme and the organisation. And then finally, what we've got, and again, it's always interesting, isn't it, in terms of what we call these pay modes, but we've got, uh, this organisation has decided to set up what it's called a strategic pay more, um, and the strategic pay more, um, has all of the center of excellence activities so it's the strategic PMO that will um, own the delivery framework the PMO tools and um, but it will also provide some project support for um, any other strategic projects that are within the um, the organization's um, portfolio. So again, it you know it, it doesn't show any kind of smaller projects being supported, but that's the particular decision that's been decided by this particular organization. So that's really kind of where we start off. Now, what happens if we don't have that um, in our organizations? And I would suggest there's a couple of things that we, we do really need. We do need to understand the scope of our PMO and we do need to have a vision for our PMO in order to be a true service based um, PMO, because that is what will take us into um, delivering what's right for our organization because any service that we provide has to demonstrate that it is of value to the organization. And again, this is a, I always find this a really interesting one as part of a, a number of courses that I deliver. I ask the delegates, you know, kind of give me the top three things that you think your PMO can do for your organization. And we get the lists. And then I have two subsequent revisits uh, to that list, which kind of always kind of makes them kind of sit back and think a little bit, a bit more in terms of, Who's made the decision that that's what the, your organization needs? Is that you as a PMO professional, as an experienced kind of PMO professional, you've kind of you know that this is really important to our organization? Is it something that the project and program managers are shouting out for because they really need some support in delivery? Or is it something that's been kind of asked for from the senior management team in terms of trying to find the right oversight and governance over the projects in their organization. So it becomes really important for us to understand where the source, where the requirement kind of comes from and being able to demonstrate the value to the organization um, for each of those services that have been provided. So um, as we would for implementing anything else, um, in an organization, we would typically draw up a benefit map that demonstrated how the particular services the PMO uh, were going to deliver actually um, adds value. So the first thing we would do, absolutely go and speak to the stakeholders and start looking at the types of services that they're, they're after. And then we're gonna to have to work with those customers and work with the people who are gonna be involved in delivering the service um, in terms of, well, what is it um, that that um, service is going to actually provide? What output is it gonna give the organization? What uh, business change, you know, what, how, how are we going to have to work differently in our organization and use these outputs to the benefit of the organization? Because there's no point from a PMO saying, well, one of the services that we're going to provide is the development and maintenance of a project delivery framework, along with some training services to train people up in that delivery framework, unless people are actually going to use that delivery framework to deliver projects. So we have to think about um, what is it we're actually going to, do, you know, what's the output from the services, but actually how's the world going to have to change in order to be able to use those outputs to give us a desired outcome or some kind of key results. So you see uh, an example might be if we talked about the kind of the methodology, what are the desired outcomes where we have a consistent approach to delivery, which kind of will then give us perhaps the benefits of simplifying and consolidated reporting and understanding where we are against our strategy and which is one of the key objectives of the PMO. So if the PMO has been set up to say we're setting up an enterprise portfolio office to be able to um, have oversight and be able to demonstrate progress against our strategy, we can see that this particular service absolutely drives into that PMO objective, which of course will be aligned to the corporate objectives. So there are some times where we have, you know, kind of suggested services and we would do that kind of left to right um, situation. But actually, 
there are other times when actually we have to work from right to left. So we look at kind of, well, why is our PM, particular PMO being set up? You know, what benefits is the organisation looking to get from having the PMO? What is it hoping that we're going to achieve? Uh, so what are the kind of the key results? What are the desired outcomes? And therefore, you know, what are the outputs? What are the services we're going to have to provide in order to be able to, to drive those outcomes and benefits for the organisation? So to me, before, you know, before we even kind of start thinking about setting up any service, we need to understand the why from the organization's perspective. And again, once we start kind of adding in some numbers into all of this, then actually then we can start uh, being able to look at some kind of prioritization about which services um, should be set up first. So I've just got a, a, an example in, in, in a little bit more uh, detail here. So this is an example where we're saying that actually some of the services that we're gonna provide, we're gonna validate any of the uh, benefits that are going to be within the business case because that makes good sense. But we're also going to help prioritize those business case against some defined criteria and um, because what that will then allow the organization to do. So the output it will provide for the organization is a recommended list of prioritized projects for inclusion in the portfolio. Now, I have to say it's a recommended list. It's not the list. Uh, we do know that the executive always get the final say, but it comes up with that recognized uh, recommended list. So the outcome for the organization is that we have a consistent approach to identify any potential proposed projects and what that contribution is going to be to strategy. But also our organization will no longer be approving projects that actually don't contribute to strategy. And the, uh, the end benefit, and we've kind of translated this into pounds, shillings and pence, the end benefit is really that actually, by the end of the year, we shouldn't, uh, we should have saved ourselves if our projects are roughly about 600,000 a piece. And we know that, you know, kind of retrospectively, that 10 of the projects we did last year really didn't contribute to, to the strategy as we'd anticipated. Potentially, we can save ourselves up to six million pound a year. So um, I know we like to go to pound, shillings and pence. It's not always possible, um, but that benefit can be a um, qualitative benefit, not just a quantitative benefit, but if we can make it uh, quantitative and, and monetize, then even better. I think what we have to recognize is once we've done the benefits map, what that starts to help us to do, and we'll come back to this when we start going into the design, is we start then recognizing, well, from a PMO perspective, what are some of the things that we're going to have to develop and build in order to deliver these two services that we've anticipated. So a couple of things that we're going to have to do, well, we're going to have to develop a business case template. So if we're going to have, if we're going to validate the benefits included in the business case, then actually we need a business case template. So there may already be one, there may be some kind of change uh, required to that template. We're going to have to develop a prioritization framework. So we've said the services prioritization against that defined framework. But what is that framework? Is there a standard one we can pick off the shelf? There's a number of kind of frameworks out there. But ideally, we would do a level of bespokeness for our particular organization because our uh, senior management team will know what's important and what should come to the top of the list. So we would work with them to kind of build that kind of framework up in order to be able to deliver this service. We're also going to have to establish appropriate governance. Now, this is a big, uh, big bone of contention um, for a lot of organisations. We'll, and we'll come back to this later. So we can define a service in the organisation. So we look at this one particularly, the validation of the benefits within the business case. And um, that means that we need to be given some delegated authority and somebody, it may not necessarily just be the PMO, but it may be the project sponsors, it may be the senior managers in the organisation, have to ensure that the roles, uh, the accountability for using 
that business case is established across the organization because we can sit there in the PMO and say you must fill in this template and unless we've got the support from the governance structure in the rest of the organization the project program managers and sponsors can say well in your dreams Eileen in your PMO yes I quite like my nice little three-page PowerPoint template senior management are quite happy to sign my business cases off on that I don't want to have to move to your particular template. So we do have to go through and make sure the governance is in place. And also um, we need to kind of build the actual kind of services, which is what we're gonna come on to in terms of how that's going to work, but also make sure we've got the right skills and capability to be able to deliver that service because just because we want to deliver that service doesn't necessarily mean we've got uh, the skills and capability to do so. So that's a bit of a kind of a, an insight in terms of what's required. I just thought it was useful to show you that in respect of the, the kind of the benefits map when deciding uh, what service in order to kind of go back to start thinking about well, what's actually involved in bringing this service um, to the organisation. Anybody, um, uh, anybody done any benefits maps for their services? How else do you, anybody got any ways of um, selecting services for their organization? Happy if anybody wants to talk? Anybody wanna say anything? Or stick something in chat in terms of how you decide on is it just a case of because senior management shout very loudly and tell us what services they need to provide? Or have we got something a little bit more? At Eileen, at Deloitte, it's very much a senior stakeholder wants something and the PMO have to implement it. Okay. So we've got a really, really good um, demand process in place with business case templates that all our business relationship managers have to use, our demand managers have to use, it then goes through a tool. So it's really mature and established process. And, and, uh, um, sorry, is that, are you talking about projects then, or are you talking about the services that the PMO provides? But that, looking at what you're doing, that it's what I've just said is about our portfolio prioritization and okay. how we kick projects off. The process around that is really well established, mature but it's fully supported by senior manager. Okay, so we've got so, the in place. Yes. And, and, and how did you, when you, sorry, Harry, just to kind of take that the next step further, and how did you, or why did you decide, and how did you justify actually kind of setting up that whole kind of demand management services that your PMO delivers? Partly global. We deliver to a global standard. So we kind of had to. Um, so see, that's why the senior stakeholders are fully um, supportive of it. But with the UK have actually led the process in that place and we're now implementing it worldwide the way that we do it because it's worked so well. But we, are, we have become a real global firm. So everyone is trying to do the same thing, which is very challenging. Okay, and, and it's interesting, we'll, we'll come on to that kind of conversation as well in terms of, you know, kind of when we're deciding on a service and we're setting up a service about kind of what the scope is and whether we do the same as other um, PMOs or whether we kind of go alone in terms of doing our own our own thing. Anybody okay. else? Sorry, Harry. No, no, it's fine. I just said, okay, thank you. That's okay. Anybody else got a, a, a kind of a demand management process, not necessarily for the projects, that we were, was a bit of that conversation, but a demand management process. How did you decide on what services that your PMO is, or how do you decide on what your PMO does on a day-to-day -day basis? Who makes that call? Any justification? Nobody. That's okay. No, that's fine. It's always interesting to kind of, to, to kind of um, see that process. So let's just um, have a look then in terms of kind of what's um, involved. And we, we've given kind of some indication of for a, a specific example, but I want to kind of take it uh, just to kind of a step back to some of the things that we need to consider um, when we're developing a service. So surprisingly, the PMO has a service life cycle, yes. Uh, the two key inputs into that are the overall PMO service strategy, um, but also we have the overall kind of PMO vision. Um, and 
it really is um, important that we use this as a basis for deciding what services we have. Um, and in some kind of circumstances, even though, you know, we may be asked to deliver some services that we don't necessarily have the kind of the skills and capability capability to deliver so this process can be used for setting up services internal to our organization but we can actually kind of outsource some of those um, services to elsewhere now you'll see because we've got this life cycle what we would also recommend because the introduction introduction of a service and as we uh, demonstrated in the benefits map is that we're introducing a change into the organization we're going to be changing what we do as a pmo because that'll be a new service but potentially um, in order to do that kind of business change element we're going to be asking the project program managers potentially to do something different we may be asking senior managers um, to do things um, different we may be asking kind of the sponsors uh, and the rest of the organization we may be asking our suppliers to do things differently so we should really be looking at the introduction of any particular service um, to use a project delivery framework now i'm a big believer in saying well actually you should be using the same delivery framework as we ask all of our other projects to deliver to and um, absolutely tailored so it's not a hammer to uh, strike the nut and it may actually be part of either a, a bigger program to establish a PMO or it may be uh, part of a backlog of uh, individual services because you're taking an agile approach to implementing those services but it should sit within a delivery framework which would ensure you've got the right level of governance to uh, make sure you've got your requirements you've got your build and your test and, and you're going through all of the right stages with the right sign-offs to deliver a service that adds some value to the organization Without that vision and service strategy, so if you've not got one from a kind of a, a global perspective, then it really is, I think, worth doing one from your own PMO perspective. Think about what your PMO is there to deliver and think about some high level kind of strategic approach to deliver in your service. So, you know, it may include things like actually we're going to deliver them all in house. It's going to be limited by the skills and capability of the um the current uh, established PMO, it may say things like actually there are certain things that we're going to outsource, we're going to work closely um, with some other PMOs in the organisation. So even if we haven't got a fully uh, integrated PMO model across the organisation, we can still work closely with other um, PMOs. And we then go into, um, we're just going to go through kind of some of the key elements of setting up uh, the PMO. Um, the design, the test and pilot and things that need to be in place then for transitioning into PMO operations. Now, the interesting thing about the design, we don't always need to design from scratch. We may be in the fortunate position where the service that we provide has actually already been delivered by another PMO in um, to some other projects across the organization. And again, this is, you know, kind of one of the, the benefits of having an integrated PMO model and um, recognizing where the different uh, services are being provided because even though I may not be able to take the service and do it 100%, it would certainly give me the good basis for my uh, design of my particular service. Um, and as Harry mentioned, it may be actually we're delivering exactly the same service in a, in a consistent manner, in which case a lot of that design work has already been done for us. But if we're in the, in the business of setting up a new service that's not been uh, there um, in the other organisation, we have to recognize who the kind of the design stakeholders might be. So again, typically, um, that's going to be the delivery teams, the management team, uh, including the executive and also kind of the, the business, the kind of the business as usual individuals, as well as the PMO itself. Now, one of the, the interesting things when we're going through the kind of the PMO design is we often talk quite a bit to the the end customers of the output that the service may be uh, providing. So, for example, we may be talking to the senior executives. Uh, we're setting up the reporting service for the first time and the senior executives say, well, actually, what we'd like is we'd like a, um, a fortnightly report of all of the projects across the portfolio. 
Yes, uh, and we would like that uh, to feed into a, a meeting where we can make decisions and, and see progress. And from a PMO perspective, you say, what a brilliant idea. Yes, we can go away and kind of provide all of the templates for that. We've got experience of doing it. Do you know, we've even got a system whereby we can kind of extract that information from. And we almost kind of commit to doing that because that's obviously a job the PMO is going to do. We're going to pull together those reports and send them and present them and, and do our storytelling around that to the senior executives. What we have to also remember that any service that we provide typically has a supply chain that we are going to be dependent upon in order to be able to deliver that service. And so if we say absolutely yes, a fortnightly report for every project, we need to be clear that the project managers are also bought into and have time and headspace to be able to produce that information on a fortnightly basis. Yes. So, you know, no project manager is going to thank you for kind of committing them to do it. Yes. And it's going to be a 20 page report. Yes. That's going to have some kind of standard pros. It's almost kind of going to be have to be handcrafted by each project manager. So we have to be very careful about what we commit to producing where we've got a supply chain in the organization. And again, we can say, absolutely, we can provide that report. We'll take finance information. We'll get kind of um, statistics from HR in terms of kind of utilization. Uh, we'll get information from business as usual in terms of how the latest implementations have gone. And all of a sudden, we're now committing all of these kind of different business as usual areas to provide information reports access to systems without really having that kind of conversation so we need to be very clear about what the end-to-end -end, uh, service is going to look like before we can actually kind of commit to delivery so when we talk about these kind of the stakeholders they're not just the, the potential customers of the service they're also the kind of the supply chain for the service as well and Interestingly, I know we've had some uh, fun and games uh, with um, some, sometimes that supply chain might include external suppliers. So um, I know if you're keeping your data up on the cloud, then actually kind of being able to pull that data off depends on the cloud being available and all of that kind of security and who has access, etc. So think very carefully about kind of how you engage with your stakeholders, what you're committing to, um, and how you want to kind of engage with some of the suppliers um, and interestingly, about recognizing if there is actually, we talk about, you know, kind of what's in it for them. So what's what's the benefit to the project managers about providing all of that information to senior executives on a weekly or fortnightly basis? Might not be, they may not necessarily perceive any benefit to them, in which case we need to start thinking about, well, actually what the benefit is to the organization. So they may not be direct beneficiaries, but kind of secondary beneficiaries of continuing to work for a successful um, organization. It's important to think as well in terms of what some of the key outputs are going to be um, from the whole kind of design of that service. And the first thing we, we want to think about, which is really kind of um, where we can lean on um, Stuart's book um, about the service uh, management, is to start thinking about what kind of information is actually going to be held in the service catalogue. Now, a service catalogue is one of those kind of key documents that kind of underpins the service, uh, the service delivery catalogue, the service delivery strategy that says these are the specific services that are provided by a PMO. So in its entirety, it's owned by each individual PMO manager. The PMO director may have a consolidated view across the organization, but essentially as a PMO manager, our role is to ensure that we have the right set of services being delivered well for the organization. And the PMO service catalog is how we have that kind of engagement with the organization in terms of, well, what do you do with the PMO? Well, these are the services we, are, we, we provide. Now, I've given you um, here 
Um, this uh, I've taken straight from the um, fields that are used in the PMO service catalogue um, in uh, Stuart's book. But uh, there are potentially, you know, in your particular organisation, there may be some other things that you want to include um, in terms of things like kind of anything relating to kind of supporting tools and system, any costs associated with the, the service, etc. Um, just a, a couple of things that I want to pull out in, in terms of the types of things that go in the service catalogue, the things that will need to be agreed as you're starting to, to set up these services is about, you know, kind of who and why this, the service might be used by those customers and how we'll deliver that service. So what are the kind of the key elements to the delivery of that service? Some interesting terms in terms of metrics and measures. Um, and the important thing when we talk about metrics and measures, we've done lots of other kind of podcasts on that, and I'm sure there's more coming on metrics and measures, is what we don't want to do is what we don't want to do is just measure how busy the PMO is. Yes, we're not just interested in how many reviews we did last week or how many business case reviews. We want some real um, meaningful metrics that allow us to um, understand what value this is to the organisation. And one of the key um, things that we also include there in terms of how the PMO will deliver that service is something called a SIPOC table, which is suppliers, inputs, process, outputs and customers. So this is a really kind of helpful table that gives a really kind of high level view to the end customer in terms of what's involved in delivery of that service. Now, for all of you who've done your P3O and wondered when you'd ever use a swim lanes diagram, well, look, here we go. Here's an example of it. So you can actually kind of embed a swim lanes diagram within the SIPOC table to, um, to demonstrate the value that you're um, providing, what's involved in each particular step, uh, what the inputs and outputs would be. And you'll notice that in these processes, we've got kind of some process boxes. We'll come back uh, and we'll talk a little bit more in terms of detail, in terms of kind of where that's um, dealt with. So, and just there's a, there's a couple of questions. Um, well, it's... <laughs> Well, it's a value. Interesting, uh, Jonathan, you talk about whether we should aim for a value driven instead of a service driven PMO. I really struggle to kind of know the difference between those two, because if we're service driven, our choice of services is about delivering value back into the organization. Um, so uh, interesting uh, that you would kind of differentiate the two. This um, service catalogue is really what's seen to the outside, um, to our customers. And what we would also do to support our service is to develop what we would call our operations handbook. So this is our internal PMO document that says, if we're gonna provide this service to our customers, well, actually this is what we're gonna do within the PMO. We're going to kind of, we're gonna have a, um, a, a, an inbox where we'll receive the requests and um, then one of the PMO administrators will allocate that to a PMO analyst to do. We will make sure that it's kind of, um, there's, we'll record information in certain places. We're going to use some particular processes, techniques or templates in order to be able to kind of provide the outputs that's required by that particular service. So this, again, this operations handbook is some people call it a, a playbook is how we're going to actually kind of deliver the service from an internal perspective we may not necessarily want to share that uh, with the rest of the organization now the interesting thing is is if we've got a service catalog our service catalog could look very very similar to a service catalog that sits elsewhere in the organization, but our operations handbook might look very different because some of the system and the processes that we use within our PMO might be a, a little bit uh, different to what's used. And certainly um, when I've worked in a large global organization, we had an integrated PMO that sat across the globe. We had a shared service catalog, but it's the operations handbook that were all different because uh, as we were in different parts of the globe, we had different kind of um, 
different elements that we had to kind of tick off as we go. And again, within that operations handbook should also include the instructions on how we are going to monitor uh, the performance of that service so we can quickly identify where the service is not being used, where it's not being delivered effectively, or where the customers are particularly unhappy with the service that's being provided. So all of that sits within an operations handbook um, within the PMO. So that kind of that, that whole piece of design says when we kind of come out of that, we are in a, a good position then to be able to understand all of the requirements that we've kind of previously talked about. Um, and we can go and start building the kind of the, the templates and the and um, the processes and procedures that kind of sit behind the service catalog and the operations handbook. And one of the things that we uh, we do need to also look at uh, when we're starting to think about kind of testing that is how much piloting we want to do with a particular service. Now, interesting in terms of kind of how much piloting we want to do, because we may want to decide to do a manual pilot where we do the service we kind of provide all of that information but we might want to use um, and, and i say this from kind of bitter experience some convoluted spreadsheets and um, we've kind of gone through the process of particular kind of meetings that need to take place to support so the resource for example the resource management process and only when we've been through some kind of piloting from a manual system do we want to then look at implementing a tool, a proprietary tool to do that kind of resource management? So very much we can look at kind of make sure that the processes and procedures actually kind of work. Um, and it helps us then perhaps to look at what kind of system or how the system can support that. But it also just kind of does that double check to make sure that we've got the resources, we've got the capability within the PMO in order to be able to deliver those services. So, you know, we always kind of are a bit nervous about kind of big bangs uh, when we when we're starting to implement services. If we're a small project office, implementing a service kind of going straight to live might not necessarily be an issue. But certainly if you're starting to deliver them from a, a, an organization wide perspective, then actually that becomes a, a little bit more um, difficult. And one other kind of thing then that I just want to say before we end um, about going live is to start thinking about having the right support structure in place in order to support that structure going forward. So typically, uh, each service would have a service owner who actually understands the benefits map for that particular service is the key contact um, for the key customers of that service. Um, we have a PMO service manager who actually ensures that the service is in place, potentially has done the kind of the design and implementation of the service. And then we've got the service operatives who are the people who are actually undertaking the services, undertaking the activities in the PMO handbook as they kind of um, as we deliver that service on a daily, weekly or an ad hoc basis. So interestingly, in terms of um, those particular roles, we're quite happy that they don't need to be three individual individual people and they can be a single person who does the owner, manager and operative role. And what we've got there on the right hand side in a larger organisations, the people who are typically who will fulfil that role. So at a kind of a, at a, at a portfolio office, the typically your PMO director would oversee the services that are being provided to the kind of the, the, the board. But if it's down, it may be down at the PMO manager. Um, the service manager, and again, we cover this very much in the House of PMO um, Essentials for PMO Analysts, is they typically going to be the service managers. They're going to be the people who are implementing and building the services and overseeing the services for the customers on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, it'll be the analyst and potentially the PMO administrators who are actually doing those services on behalf of the um, on behalf of the organisation. And I can't believe it's 12.55 already. That is absolutely a whistle-stop tour 
of the whole kind of concept of services and setting up services and some of the things um, that need to be considered. As I say, um, it, it hopefully kind of gives you a view of kind of what uh, might be involved. We're happy um, to kind of have some further detailed conversations. There's more information in the um, House of Payment Essentials certifications, but as a kind of a whistle stop tour of what's involved in setting up services, hopefully that's been of um, some use. Has anybody got any pertinent questions? that immediate so you know we're, we're always available um, on via the house of PMO and um, via LinkedIn or on our website to answer any questions if there's kind of more detailed questions you want to answer and um, feel free to kind of to get in touch but before we go I do want to just kind of get into uh, uh, just tell you about this developing the PMO service catalog so um what we've got in the minute um is the book um, what we've got, um, we've written an extra bit in terms of kind of pay more service management, so a high level guide to setting up, running, improving and closing uh, pay more services available to pay more uh, members. And um, what we're looking to do in a community led project is to expand the list of services. So I said Stuart has done a, a mammoth task to get us kind of started off, but we recognise that there are other services that perhaps people want this kind of start off attend. So I said the service catalogue can be quite generic. The detail really comes in terms of kind of how you do them in your organisation, in your pay more operations handbook. So in terms of this kind of community led project, what we we've done is we've opened up on the House of PMO website and if you go over there you can actually kind of anybody can type in some information and say well actually this is a service that we deliver in our PMO uh, and fill in the kind of the standard fields it doesn't need to be absolutely dotting every i and crossing every t but we're starting to collate those additional services and what we're doing is we're setting up a review group who will then review the information that's been provided, make sure it's generic, it doesn't have details in about your organisation. It may be kind of um, slightly amended, so it kind of sits alongside some other services that already exist. And what that review group will be involved in doing is actually kind of publishing them out onto the PMO website. So yes, the book is still there uh, to, to procure with lots of information in, but we're going to start building up some additional services that people want to see and um, the, the details of or get some ideas about what can be delivered. And so we're looking for members to nominate themselves to come on to the review group. Now, we've had a couple of people um, already who've requested who I will be getting back to after this um, session. Um, and, and a couple of them are not um, paid up members, so they're free members. And I, I, I will say that one of the things that we'll be doing, we'll, we'll be prioritising people who are full members to be in that review group. So that doesn't mean that uh, if you're not a full member, you can't um, join the group. And um, we're, we're going to look at kind of the response that we get, and particularly if you've got lots of experience of uh, developing service catalogue, you would be a great boon to that, uh, to that uh, review group. So typically I'm only expecting that review group to meet every kind of two to three months to look at the list of things that have come through. But if you're interested, then go over to um, the House of PMO and uh, fill out the form and we will be in touch. Um, and also if you're, you know, kind of you're sitting there in your PMO and say, well, actually I'd like a bit more information on what's available, you know, kind of what kind of services, what does it look like to give me an idea of what would be involved, then just drop a line about what service you'd like to see. And again, that may be something the review group could kind of pick up and develop uh, the service catalogue entry that would give you a good start of a 10 in your organisation. OK, so I look forward to uh, hearing from some people who are involved in that. Um, that's me from a, a service perspective. Um, there is, I'm just going to rattle through these, um, the next three uh, dates for your diary. 
um, in terms of we've got somebody talking about um, reporting and metrics from an agile perspective. Uh, we've got a great session on the 26th of April where we're going to be talking about being a critical friend for somebody who actually does it as a job full time. That is their job, which will be great to hear from that. And then for those of you who may not be aware, we've restarted our pay more work from home, which we did weekly through the pandemic and the lockdown. Um, people found it of such good value because not everybody's back out and about yet. Uh, we now hold that monthly and the next one of that is on the 13th of May. And um, all of that proceeds, dun, 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 we're back out there in our conference. So we've got um, two days in Edinburgh. We've got a day of training, pay more learn on the um, 8th of June, followed by a conference in London on the 9th. And then we're having the weekend off and we're all high tailing it up to Edinburgh. Um, and the following week on the 14th of June, doing the same pay more learn. And on the 15th of June, doing uh, the conference in Edinburgh. Now, I'm conscious that um, um, everybody uh, may want to attend, but perhaps kind of um, hasn't got the wherewithal. And um, if you go over to the House of Payment website or look out for our posts on LinkedIn, there is a competition um, out there at the minute that says if you kind of put your name and who you'd like to take to the conference, you'll go into a free draw. We've had a second draw this week. We've got the final draw now uh, for the conference. And um, as I think I shared on my LinkedIn uh, yesterday, you need to be in it to win it. So do feel free to uh, join in the, the, the competition. So uh, lovely to see you all. Thank you very much for attending. I hope you found it useful. I, I did warn you at the beginning, it was going to be a whistle top show, a whistle stop tour. Hopefully you found something. If you've got any more questions, then please let me know. Have a great afternoon and we're near enough now to the kind of the weekend to say have a great weekend too. See you at the next event. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.